So Bushman, welcome on a member of the all SEC second team this year. He's a sophomore guard for Georgia, Severe Wheeler. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. For sure, man. Well, I mean, you obviously just said you're coming off winning a great season so far. Obviously, you guys probably would want to be in the tournament right now. But personally, all SEC second team right now is a sophomore, high accolade. Trying to taste the season. How's it feel? I know it's been a blessing just to see um, that the stuff, the work I put in in the offseason kind of pay off. Um, and then, you know, it's a credit to my coaching staff for believing me and my teammates for also instilling that confidence daily. Um, letting them know that, you know, they trust me to make plays and I'll, I'll make the best play for the team, make winning plays. And uh, But there's still more work to be done. There's still goals that I want to achieve. And, uh, you know, and right now with the offseason, it's, it's time to get back to work. I know, obviously, the biggest thing this past year has been COVID. We know teams have been taking pauses on and off throughout the year. It's been hectic. Obviously, all the protocols. How was that for you? How did you get adjusted to all that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I had I, – I caught COVID earlier in, in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to kind of, like, you know, not have to test every day for the, for the most of the year um, because, you know, during that season, that six-month period, you don't have to you don't have to test and wake up early in the morning. But, you know, towards the end of the year when I got back into the fold, it was kind of annoying to wake up at, you know, 8, mm -hmm. 8, 8 o'clock in the morning every day to go take the test. But, you know, um, we do, we're doing what's best. You know, we want everyone to stay safe. We want everyone to be healthy. And you don't want to put your teammates or yourself in jeopardy of getting it. So, uh, you know, the coach, the coaching and the staff, everyone at UGA, um, they did a great job of, you know, constantly reminding us to put our mask on and putting their best foot forward to make sure everyone stays um, safe and healthy. Uh, that we're getting into the season, all your college career so far, but I kind of want to go back a little bit because you're originally from Harlem, New York. You obviously, you grew up then in Texas, and that's really where you played your high school career out at. Kind of here's that transition. Like, what was it like obviously, growing up in Texas? Um, it, it was good. Um, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot um, more smoother and and calm and, and friendly in, in in Houston, Texas. There's a lot more people you can build a relationship with. Um, you know, it's one of the most diverse cities um, in the country. So going to high schools, I was able to make meet people of all walks of life, be able to build relationships with people that I still you know carry on and talk to to this day. And, um, and obviously, from a basketball standpoint, there's a lot of talent that has come out of Texas and Houston. Um, so be able to play against those guys every year and receiving, you know, the best training from my dad and um, and basketball university with Coach Rossi Karen, that kind of elevated my game to another level. So, you know, it was it was, it was a good it was a good transition. And um, there's nothing like Houston. Now, what kind of led to that move? I mean, I'm not sure exactly how young you were in New York, but how what kind of led to the transition from going from New York to Texas? Yeah, my, my, uh, my, my dad had already had siblings down here. And, uh, you know, we wanted to get a fresh start, um, live somewhere, you know, a lot more quiet, have more space. Um, it's, you know, cheaper living down in Texas. Um, and, I, and I think personally, you know, I think the heat attracted him a little bit. I mean, he likes <laughs> – I'm not a big fan of the summer, but um, I like the cold. But well, Texas is either super cold or super hot, so. Without a doubt. Well, then you've had in your high school career, and we know you're not the tallest guard out there, but that fr at that freshman point, you're five foot six, right around that point. You come out there and you're obviously on a great team, 28-11 team. Kind of I guess is that team and just what it was like kind of getting used to the high school level. Uh, my freshman year, I was actually like five three. Mm -hmm. um, I think I averaged thirteen and nine, thirteen and eight. Um, it was a learning process just due to the fact that there were so many seniors on the team. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of people, a lot, especially the seniors, they kind of wanted. It was not. It was, wasn't really a selfish thing, but you know, they wanted. It was the last year around, so they wanted to do what was best for them and um, get those last opportunities. So I felt at the end that kind of divided us. But whereas my sophomore, junior year, guys kind of finally bought into the program and know like, hey, if we win, we play together. All the stuff that you want, all the accolades, all the offers and everything is going to come with it because we were such a high level group. We had talented dudes. We had dudes that were getting recruited. So we knew we could come together as a team that all that stuff would take care of itself. You clearly have learned how to play at a disadvantage from your height now throughout your entire career. We see it through college now and high school as well. But it's not easy. There's very few guys that are able to push through that and ultimately become a guy that's highly ranked like yourself and pan out in college. How have you been able to really just disregard the height factor and be able to use it to almost like to an advantage or degree and become this successful this early on? Um, I think the biggest thing was my dad always saying that we're going to uh, craft you or mold you to where you never have to change your game no matter where you are. Um, you don't have – you're never going to have to, you know, adjust to the level because you're already playing at great speed. You're already making plays for others. You're already – play defense, you already can gain a pain, create. Um, you already have good leadership skills. So 
when um that's that's how I was molded. That's how I was you know brought up. That's how I was raised as far as the basketball level, the basketball way. It's just I've never changed my game. Be a guy who's like you know irreplaceable, so, so to speak, or try to be that. Mm -hmm. Um, due to the fact that you know I'm not the tallest point guard in the world. So with that, I mean I I, I mean I did everything twice as hard than everyone. I mean I was in the gym three times as more as the next person, and um that kind of got me to where I am today. At any point, did you start doubting yourself? Never. Nah. Yeah, I never, never doubted myself. I always thought that, you know, I always thought of myself as the best. And the only way to be the best is go play against the best. And I typically, I outperformed anyone I was matched up with. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can go back and look up at, you know, any records or any game, any stats. And, um, I did that. I won big games. I won my matchups on the circuit. Won my matchups in high school. Won, you know, two state championships. Um, you know, we had our last summer, we was 31 and four, 31 and five on the gauntlet, on Adidas gauntlet. So I did. Um, I you know I never ran from the smoke. I never ran from anything. I think that's what got me. I mean, got me respected and got me to where I am today as well. Now, throughout this time, you have another teammate that's also doing a stand out there in Northwestern right now, and Miller. Kind of discuss your as Bond. What was it like just growing with him and playing alongside him? Yeah, I've been playing with Miller since I was in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. um, actually, yeah, fifth grade. I was in fifth grade, fifth or sixth grade. Um, so I've seen Miller in the ups and downs. Um, you know him. And my, um, Miller and I, we work out together all the time. Uh, you know, you know, my dad kind of taught him most of the, some of the stuff. Well, I like to think most of the stuff that he knows. <laughs> but uh, Miller, I mean, he's, he's, he's a hard worker. Um, playing with a guy like that is just motivating because, you know, when you're not in the gym, he's there. So it's kind of like that. We're motivating each other. I um, mean, you've just known each other for so long. You are, Obviously, you build that brother bond, um, bond. So even though, like, we're not, you know, talking about basketball, I always felt comfortable talking to, talking to him about anything else, whether it was schoolwork, um, you know, whether it's even about a girl, but, uh, so yeah, Miller, you know, I, I love Miller. I mean, he's a great dude. And I think he has a chance to get to the next level as well. Now that's something that maybe the general fans aren't really completely understand how impactful it is, but when you are a guy, that you know, you're a division one, especially high major kind of guy, being able to have another guy in your corner that you rock out with that, you know, was working for the same goal as you, he's kind of pushing for that same goal as you. How critical was that just for your development? Um, it was big time, but I think, also having, I had, my dad was kept me around other dudes who were, who were NBA players, who were pros, um, who were division one players. So I could always see it in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were days, like, especially when I was younger, where I would struggle. Um, you know, he would put me against the 17 you guys and I'm in the seventh, eighth grade. <laughs> I mean, you know, he would put me, I'm guarding, you know, the point guard or university of George, I mean, university of Georgetown, Jonathan Moore when I'm, you know, in ninth grade. So, like, I always saw what it took to be at that level, and, and I always played against dudes who were better than me at the time, who were physically stronger, physically faster. So by the time the game to me, game would come, I'm already used to the physicality, the speed of it. I'm already thinking, you know, kind of like light years ahead, so to, so to say. So the game seems slower to me. So now, you know, I think that was a big, a, a big advantage for me is just having that development, you know, kind of like increased. Um, being able to uh, think the game and, and talk the game to other players who don't necessarily understand at a fast pace, and also and it's understandable. So I think he did a great job with that, you know, towards my development. Obviously, having dudes of my age or peers that I've played with, I kind of want that same path to go into the NBA. So, you know, us motivating each other and us playing against those other high-level guys really helped us. Who were some guys? Like, who were some guys that your dad put you up against? You mentioned a couple of names, but who were some of the NBA guys? There's other great players you really were able to kind of learn from and grow up with. Yeah, Chepo Gucci is one. He was on the Nigerian national team. Um, he played against Team USA and had 28. And he won uh, – they, they qualified that year, and he was the team MVP. Um, you know, I, you know Jonathan Moore, University of Georgia guard – I mean, Georgetown. I don't know why I keep saying Georgia. Um, <laughs> Anthony Jackson, um, he plays overseas. He went to Akron, New Mexico. Dan, you told me. Um, he went to USC last year. Um, you know, some other other guys around in Houston that, you know, I've been playing with and playing against. So all those guys are the ones that, you know, first come to mind. And, and those who, who were with me in the gym day in, day out, even up to last summer, like we're still going to be in the gym together, even when I go back home. So um, that was sprinkled in with, you know, Miller, those guys, and even my little brother. So now that now that he's coming up. So I've always been in the gym where, you know, competition, you know, makes or breaks you. Like, it's always about competing. It's always about getting better. It's always about pushing the next guy. Mm -hmm. And you stayed at high school for your entire career, and that's something that very few guys like doing anymore. I think it's more common maybe in Texas area since there's a lot more talent, but a lot of guys that are ranked love transferring out to the big prep schools, national schedules. Was that something you ever considered or looked at? Um, nah, nah, nah. 
Mm -hmm. We never looked at it because, um, first of all, you know, we have the strength of schedule even in Texas, and my high school had the, you know, the strongest, the hardest schedule, um, regardless of pu pu a classification, public or private school in Texas. We had the best schedule, the hardest schedule, with the best competition. So if all the talent is coming out of Texas, or most of it, why, why, would, why go to another place when you're already playing against the best? And um, so that's why I didn't go. And I love my family. I have a big family. You know, it's eight of us. <laughs> um, I got five siblings and two parents. So there's no way I wanted to leave them at any point um, and be without them. So that's why I never really considered any other prep school or anything like that. That's what's special about Texas. Obviously, it's a huge day in general, but there's a lot of different areas. You know, the Dallas area is loaded, the Houston area. There's a lot of different areas within the state that's loaded with their own separate town that could honestly compete with a lot of other states in general. But what was like that? Like, when you're talking about all these teams you're able to go up against, who were some of the favorite teams, favorite players you played against in high school? Yeah, um, you know, we played against uh, we played against South Garland with Chris Chris Harris Jr., Tyrese Maxey. Um, we played against Bel Air at the time. They had uh, Max Evans, who was the starting shooting guard for Vanderbilt. Um, you know, we played against Savion Flag. We played against Moyer Ranch. We got L.J. Cryer and uh, Eddie Lampkin. Um, we played against, man, I don't, you know, we played against Episcopal. They had loaded, loaded talent. They have Jahari Long, and they got two NFL prospects right now, and Jalen Waddle and Marvin Wilson. Um, and so this. I don't, I don't remember everybody, but <laughs> I just know it was, it was a lot of dudes there who came out who were, who were really good. And so just having the opportunity and that, you know, not every not every school can do that. Not every public school can go and schedule who they want to play. And um, and I think Houston Christian had a unique advantage of us allowing to not only schedule private schools, but also the 6A public schools and the best guys to be in the best tournaments to give us the best opportunities to get in front of people, to get known, get recognition. Was there ever that guard that you went up against, rather it be on AAU, in-state, Texas, or something that you kind of went up against that you kind of, in a way, created a rivalry or just something where you love competing against Tim, you played him multiple times? Like, was it that guy you loved going up against? Um, no, nah, I, don't, I don't think I really had um, that, that, that guy that, you know, I was like, oh, it's a rivalry. But, mm -hmm. I mean, you play against, you know, great players, you know, every week in Houston and, and in Texas. Um, they're good guards every week throughout the state. And obviously, since you've, you know, been growing up from third grade all the way to 17, you, you're going to play against those same guys a mm -hmm. couple of times. So it's more of like a man, you know, he actually panned out. He's still good to this day. It's kind of crazy, you know, just to see like, oh, man, you know, I remember playing against you first at BU All-Stars. You know, <laughs> they had RJ Hampton, Tyrese Maxey, they had Jalen Wilson, um, Davion mm -hmm. Harmon, all on the same team. And, you know, <laughs> you, know like, you look up and it's like, you know, my, my 10th grade year, 11th grade year. And we're playing an uh, all-star game and showcase Houston. It's like, dang, y'all are still good. And I know mm -hmm. they're probably think, thinking the same thing about me. Like, man, he's still out here balling. So I think that's the more, like, the crazy thing. It's like, man, like, you know, props to you for still working out and still, you know, competing and getting better every year. I know there's some guys that, you, as players, you obviously kind of can see who's going to be good and you kind of watch those guys. But was there anyone kind of growing up that came out of nowhere that kind of shocked you and you're like, wow, he's either like, ultimately become a college star, you're an NBA guy. Like, is there that guy kind of came out of nowhere, in your opinion? Uh, not not from where I'm from. Mm -hmm. Now, nah, usually the dudes who either you know who were good stay good, or the dudes who were good um, kind of just like you know faded. But I don't think there were any just like uh, up up and rising just like out of nowhere because mm -hmm. you know Houston's a big state. I mean, big city and Texas is a big state, but it's so much. There's so many people covering, doing media. Yeah. You always knew who was good, and and they do a good job of trying to cover everybody. So no one just came out the seeps of the you know concrete out of nowhere. So. I know another cool thing you just mentioned, all these guys that you've played against or even seen now at the college level. What's this been like when you match up with these guys? You go up against these guys you've grown up with at the college level. What's those games like? Um, you know, before the game, you obviously say what's up. We show you respect. But at the end of the day, you're still trying to win the game and, and mm -hmm. you're trying to perform um, because these games are crucial, not only for the winning and getting to the postseason, but these games, um, everyone's watching. them. not only just a casual fan, but NBA scouts, um, people who matter, who can get you to that next uh, – professional level so you're trying to you're trying to perform you're trying to be productive and obviously you're trying to win your matchup and win the game so you know before the game after the game is you know it's cool it's, it's, it's good but you know when it's kind of, when the game time it's, it's business out of the whole houston group you kind of grew up with who would you say is kind of the funniest guy out of all of them the funniest guy <laughs> i don't know i don't know i mean i wasn't necessarily the most friendly dude <laughs> uh, 
not until like later in my high school career when mm-hmm. you know I kind of established like all right I'm the best um mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm committed I'm, I know where I'm going um that's when I started to you know become you know you know on a on a casual you know speaking basis with everyone but growing up I wasn't real I wasn't really friendly um I didn't necessarily want to make friends with dudes like I'm competing with mm-hmm. so I don't know that's a good question. You have to ask me, like, you know, in another two or five, two to five years. <laughs> For sure. Well, then you head into your upperclassmen years, and then you win from here on out pretty much in terms of state championships. You get back-to-back, which is hard to, once again, you're in Texas, and you get that done. What was that like, you know, walk away with two state championships? Yeah, that was that was, that was was a great feeling. I personally think I, we should have won three. But mm-hmm. uh, my, my sophomore year, I broke my, I broke my hand um, mm-hmm. during the playoffs. But, um, man, that, that was great. It was great. My junior year, we were the favorite the whole year. And um, we had like three Division One players. I was committed to AM at the time. Uh, Miller, Northwestern, and Jalen Clark, who's at Saints and Corpus Christi, not transferred to Prairie View. And then we had a couple D we had a D2 dude at Our Lady of the Lake and a Division Three at Wheaton College. So we had college, you know, players at every every spot on the bench and on in the starting lineup. So we were the favorite and um, you know, some people think that come with pressure as far as like being a favorite, be able to get to win those games, win those big matchups. And we were together since we were sophomores and juniors and freshmen. So we just we took it one game at a time. Every day was about maximizing your day to get better. And so when we finally won, and it's like, man, we won. Like we did it together. We did it as a team. We had fun. We did it our way. That was kind of like, you know, a big weight off our shoulders. Like, man, we did it. Um, and so that, that was the greatest experience as far as when when you're supposed to win. You know, you know, you're fulfilling that. And then my senior year, all those guys had left. Like, all those guys were seniors, all those guys had left. And my senior year, I didn't know if I was going to play because I tore my meniscus. So I was only able to play for conference games. I played, like, 12 games my senior year. And um, we would, you know, we have a guy over 6'2". And so for us to win that, that was just, like, that was crazy. That just so how good our coaching staff was and, mm-hmm. um, and, how, and how those guys were willing to buy in to do whatever it took to win the game. I think we were the closest that year, um, just as far as like, hey, man, I'm, I'm doing this for you. I'm not doing this for me. I'm not doing this for anything else. I just want to do this so you can succeed. And when you have that mindset as a team, it is hard to beat that. I want to go through this recruiting process a little bit, because as you said, as a sophomore, you commit to a and Coach Kennedy and that whole group. And that's something we see some guys do commit earlier on in sophomore year. And oftentimes we do see a lot of guys end up decommitting eventually. But take us to that, at that point in time, sophomore year when you commit, why did you feel that that was the right place and kind of take us through that decision? Yeah, um, it was my after my freshman, after my freshman summer, they offered me, like, right began a school year, sophomore year, still end of the freshman summer, I committed. Um, I knew, I always knew I wanted to play it in the SEC, just due to the fact, the, the pace of play that fits my game, you know, up-tempo, a lot of possessions, fast-paced, um, with athletes all around the court, and I knew I could thrive in that type of um, environment, that type of system. Um, and I knew I wanted to stay close to home, um, especially being so young where I didn't necessarily know, uh, you know, how to live on my own or how to be away from my family. I was always with my family all the time, no, no matter where, where I was at. So I knew that was a big priority, not only to me, but to my parents. And um, Coach Kennedy and them, they, they, the moment you could, you know, call someone as like a prospect or even before that, when I went to the A&M camp and they were talking to my AU coaches and my dad, they always showed um, they always showed like their interest and expressed how much they wanted me on campus, how much they wanted me to, to commit. And so uh, I just felt that was the right move. Their play style was, was very similar to what I was looking for. Um, it was high pace, you know, some, you know, freedom to be able to make plays. And obviously they had pieces that I thought that I could help, um, help them win games with. And so I just felt like that was the right move. If Coach Henry was still the coach out there, at least at that time, do you think that still would have been the decision you would have went to, or were you possibly still going to reopen it, or what kind of was what, what do you think you would have possibly would have done if Coach Kennedy still was the coach? Um, if Coach Kennedy was still the coach, I would, I think I would still be at Texas a and I think that was one of the the main reasons, if not the only reason, why I, um, you know, decommitted from AM. Um, I love Coach Kennedy. I love that whole staff was with him. That includes you know Coach Amir and um, Coach Yurik and also uh, Coach Reynolds. Um, all those guys are still my guys. You know, I talked to Coach Amir. Coach, uh, Coach Amir. Um, I just talked to him recently, so I talked to him, you know, maybe two, three times a week. You know, I talked to Coach Eric, and I always talk to Coach Kennedy. I mean, you know, he's one of my favorite favorite coaches in the world. But, um, you know, if that if, if that staff was still there, I would say, like, I would still be there. Um, but, you know, 
I mean, everything happens for a reason. I'm super grateful that, you know, Coach Kennedy and his staff uh, decided to give me a chance and allow me to come be a part of this great university. Um, looking back at it, I, I wouldn't have known how I've done with a but I know with Georgia, I'm able to do some things that I'm comfortable with. Um, Coach Green has done a great job of, you know, recruiting I mean, and, and helping me feel like I have that freedom to be able to make plays and, and, and try to help us win some games. You guys compiled a pretty nice class out there. The A&M group obviously had a lot of guys that are impactful, great players right now at the college level. Kobe, we know he's doing out there in Mizzou. You know, Chris, Reek, all you guys out there. How close were you guys? And just how close did you guys originally think that group could have been if Coach Kenny and all them were still there? Like, how special was that recruiting class? Yeah, that was a, that was a great class. Um, you know, we got we were able to get together. I'm not. We all went together at once, but. If Kobe was on campus, I made sure I was on campus. If Tyreek and Chris Harris was on campus, I made sure I was there just mm -hmm. to build, continue to build that relationship and build that chemistry. So when we come in, you know, we have a sense of familiarity with each other. Um, and, you know, we'll be able to get to work a lot quicker. But um, I think, you know, looking back at it, if we all were still there, we would have been a great class. Um, I think we were one of the more underrated class. But we were, I think we were rated pretty high mm -hmm. um, while we were together. But um, I mean, all those, dudes are, all those dudes are doing great things in college. Um, you know, we just played against Kobe, not, uh, I think, last week. You know, he had a good game. So, uh, I wish nothing for the best of those guys. I mean, they're all, those guys are all in great situations to where, you know, they can show what they can do at the next level as well. And, Grant, I mean, all those guys are obviously great, but you end up joining a group that features the number one pick in the draft, Anthony Edwards, who is probably going to be the face now of Minnesota in the future, at least one of him and Cat kind of group. And, yeah, Christian's doing great. Tell me, I mean, a lot of this entire team is just loaded recruiting class. How special was this Georgia recruiting class for you that eventually joined? Yeah, um, man, when I when I was when I was finally committed, I know Aunt. Well, before I committed, Aunt had hit me up. It was like, man, just come come be a part of something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like we could possibly make this thing a, a, a special year. Um, we know we need a point guard. I need you to be my PG. <laughs> and prior to it, I played against Aunt in the Top 100 camp, so mm -hmm. I was familiar um, with how you know I was familiar with Aunt. You know, we've had conversations before. We played against them. So I knew if I had a chance to go play with the number one pick, one, A, you always want to play with great players, but two, that would give me the kind of like the exposure that I wanted and needed. Mm -hmm. And I knew, you know, playing with the number one pick, you were able to play, you, you're able to play on TV a little bit more. So I always wanted to play like, you know, on the ESPN, SEC networks. So, you know, that was the main attraction. And um, all the other guys in the recruiting class were great as well, as far as like, you know, Tumani, um, who's had a really good year, Mike Peak, even though he left. Um, he, he was good. Like, all those guys are great players and even better people off the court. Um, you know, we, we're still – all of us are still close to this day. We all text each other, um, you know, all laughing, talking about memories. So, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. Now, your honest opinion, when you first were in with Ant, obviously, I think Wiseman was number one recruit that year. I forgot exactly who Ant was. He was a 2-3, something like that, I grew. But did you originally think he would have been the number one pick, or did you think – why James might have still been in that group? Like, who would you – how special do you think he was before he started practicing and playing with Ant? Nah, you, you just know Ant was the number one pick. Mm -hmm. I know most sites had him as the number one player, you know, one or two behind Wiseman, but you knew he was the number one pick. Um, you can't pass up on a guy, you know, who could do literally everything um, when he puts his mind to it, when he's 6'5", 40-inch vertical, or 42-inch vertical. You know, he can run a step slower than me, you know, a little less quick than me, but could do everything. <laughs> he could shoot the ball. I mean, he can pass the ball, he can handle it, and he's such a, a selfless guy. He's always looking to serve others. He's always looking to keep everybody else happy, keep everybody else confident. I mean, as an NBA franchise, you can't, you can't pass up on that. And his play will just speak for itself, obviously, with his ability to score and um, his ability to take over a game. So before you can even see him play, you can just see highlights. You just knew he was a number one pick. Absolutely. Now, when you are going through that process, though, you decommit, and it's kind of the last second, then you have to go through this process kind of quickly, and that's probably not the best idea originally. We probably probably a little stressed out about that. But what were your options? Like, I know Iowa State was in the mix for you. Like, how were you able to de ultimately come to Georgia? Like, what was that whole process like right after you decommit? Yeah, when I decommitted, I kind of let my, di my dad handle the process mm -hmm. um, mostly because I knew it would be stressful. Um, so, you know, I kept the process short. Like I gave every, every coach that, you know, either I um, reached out to me or my dad, I gave them a deadline. May 6th is when I'm committing. So mm -hmm. whatever, you know, whatever is going on, I'm going to keep it up front with you. I'm going to either say I am interested or I'm not. Um, cause it wasn't, it's not, you know, it's getting late. Everyone's already committing. I think at the time, the only two point guards who were, you know, nationally ranked or at the time uh, who weren't committed was me and Cole Anthony. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
you know, everything was straight to the point. I let my dad handle the most of it, but he gave me a set of like guidelines or like a rubric, like this is what I'm looking for. And I'm going to narrow it down and whatever decision you make based on these schools, I'm going to be fine with it. And the main thing that kind of stood out to me about Georgia was, you know, Coach Crean's ability to get those guards to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he had guys like Yogi Ferrell. He had D. Wade. He had Victor Oladipo. Um, you know, he had success with guards like Marquette, you know, OG Ananobi. All those guys made it to the league through development. And I know Coach Crean's big on development, and I feel comfortable with um, not only with coach, but just the family like atmosphere here in Georgia. Everyone's supportive. Um, you know, they could tell they really wanted you and the coaching staff did a great job as well. Um, they got themselves involved. They made a point, you know, to get to know me, my my father, um, get to, you know, have a couple co conversations with my mom. They knew all my siblings, their names and everything like that. So they made the transition um super smooth. And um, you know, I was grateful for everything that was done. Who was your second option? Was at Iowa State? Was another school? Like, who was your backup plan if Georgia wasn't there? Yeah, the last two schools, um, was, it came down to Georgia and Iowa State. Mm -hmm. So, if it wasn't Georgia, it would have been Iowa State. And so, you come in that freshman year, and as you just talked about, Coach Korean's obviously a great coach, history-wise. What, what was your guys' bond like? Because obviously, being the point guard, we know he's close to every position, but that point guard, you have to have a critical relationship with Coach. How did your relationship grow from the point you got on campus, start, even, when, even when you started recruiting you, to ultimately starting to get, to get into the season? Yeah, um, that's, the, that's the thing that – well, Coach, like, he, everything he told me was, was honest and upfront. He never guaranteed me a starting spot. He gave – the only thing he said is, like, man, he's going to play. He's going to play. And, you know, if he earns it, he's going to start. And, um, you know, that's – I always tell anyone, you know, as far as, like, recruiting with Coach Crean, like, he's always going to keep it straight up with you. I mean, he always, you know, he allowed me the opportunity, you know, to prove that, you know, I went, I was able to start or, and to prove that I was, you know, a, a better playmaker at a time for our team, you know, through practice. And we competed, we played, you know, we played five and five, played four and four. Um, and we, we shot the ball and, you know, different things like that to be able to show that I, I wanted to start and I was able to, and I earned that spot. And, you know, once you, once you, you build that, that trust and that communication, that bond with Coach Crean, like he's with you, he's, you know, he's with you forever, so. That's how, that's how that went for the most part. Take us through this a little bit because we see and hear about coaches. For example, Shaka Smart is known for developing big men out there at Texas. And there's a lot of examples across the country of different coaches that get guys to the next level. But what exactly does, does that look like? Do practices, workouts, like how does he develop you guys? How did he turn it into the number one pick? And how has he developed you down to what you're becoming? Like, what is this exactly? What's this like practices like? How does he actually develop you guys into becoming elite prospects? Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing, it's like he's big on reps and film. So when, when you're in the gym, he's super detailed. He's detail oriented. Like he always says, compete against the details. Um, you know, he, he's super, super big on mastering that one rep that you have at the time. Focus on that one thing that you're doing right now. Don't focus on the past. Don't focus on what you're about to do. Focus on the right now, how you can get better. And um, he's always, you know, watching film. He watches more film than he has to be one of the top five film watchers in the world. <laughs> So he's always constantly finding ways for you to get better in the game when you play the game, watch a film with him, or, you know, in practice, um, every day is coming with a new challenge or something you could do better. Hey, work on your footwork here. Hey, make this is a better thing you could do leadership-wise. And so with that, I mean, it's, it's hard to beat that. And so he's done a great job of, you know, implementing something new every day to make sure I'm on the edge and make sure I'm able to get better. And he does that with every other player on the roster as well. What's that thing you're, he's really wanting you keying on now? We know it's off season now. You got the next however many months until you guys get back on campus, get to work like that again. What's the thing he really wants you working on and improve on for your junior year? Yeah, I think just all around game. I mean, there's nothing that you can you're fully mastered as any any player in the world. I mean, you don't. No one shoots 100 percent from the field from the first season. No one has zero turnovers, zero fouls. Um, so no one's played a perfect game yet. So you can always work on your game. And you know, he's just constantly saying, you know, work work till you, you know, you feel like you're, you're done. I mean, you always got something to work at and whether, you know, for me, so, you know, strengthen, keep strengthening my right hand to where my right hand is as good as my left hand, keep working on shooting the ball, keep working on, you know, passing, you know, different, finding different reads, you know, keep working on taking care of the ball, tying up your handle. There's always things to work on. And so he's just a big, you know, he's telling me, you know, keep that same confidence and just keep working, keep working to get better. When we look at your numbers for this past year, I mean, 14 points a game, four rebounds, 7.4 assists, almost two steals per game this year. That's big-time numbers for a sophomore. I think the one thing people can look at is three-point shooting. 
Is that something you think you can improve on? Can we expect you to be shooting a lot more threes next year? Like, how about that aspect of your game? Yeah, I mean, everyone, you know, everyone has their own opinion. I know the obviously the numbers say that I have to get better at shooting. And, you know, I do it every day. I shoot the ball every day. Um, and even now, in the, when I was all season in the summer, it's something I could even work on even more. I could put even more time, more reps in. And, um, you know, I mean, it is what it is. Um, I know when I, next year, when next year comes around, I'll definitely be a way better shooter. I'm um, just mm-hmm. having all this time, especially being to go home while you're still at school just because of the pandemic. So I'm going to use that to my advantage. And next year, everyone will see a difference. And then someone else will come up with another narrative for me to get better <laughs> at. <laughs> but to me, if I get that down, there's, none, there's nothing going to be able to stop me at all, even though there's nothing really to stop me now. Mm-hmm. That's what's scary. Like I said, 14, 4, 7, almost two steals per game is incredible numbers for a sophomore. You head into next year, though. What's your expectations? What can we expect from you in your junior campaign? Yeah, obviously to win games. Um, that's the biggest thing. Um, to win games, uh, be play at a high level. Um, statistically, also, like I said, as a team record-wise, to win games, finish top five in the SEC is my goal. And I'm obviously to make it to the NCAA tournament and make a run there. And we talk, go back to Coach Cream real quick. What's this like on a personal level? Like when you're talking to him just about day to day, not even about basketball per se, just what's this like on a personal level? Yeah, I mean, Coach Cream is super relatable. Um, he's personal. Like he's a person that you come to about anything outside of basketball, about life, you know, about academics, about anything. Um, you know, he's a he's an open, he's an open book. Um, he's willing to share his stories and his life experiences. Um, you can call him at three o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. I don't know why he's up that early, but he will answer <laughs> the phone. <laughs> he, he will answer the phone and get back to you as soon as he can. Um, you know, he, he tries to show his little humor, his little personality by throwing in jokes every once in a while. <laughs> but, you know, Coach Crane is a super cool dude off the court. But on the court, you know, he's business. I mean, he's all about winning. He's intense. Um, not many people like Coach Crane in the world. I can, I can guarantee you that. So I'm guessing you've called him early in the morning than before? Yeah. Well, I know people who have, and I know people who have, and, and he's mm-hmm. asked for the first ring. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, let's head into that freshman year, because obviously you come in there, we know this team has got a lot of hype because they're super young with all you guys, but you eventually start really producing at a high level. You eventually move into the starting lineup, which we'll get into in a second, but what was like just adjusting to the freshman level, just playing for college basketball? What was that first year like? Um, that first year was good. It was a good year. Um, record-wise, you know, we were 500, but I felt it was a good year just to be able to, you know, like I said, have an opportunity to play alongside the number one pick <laughs> and, um, and kind of getting used to everything. I think the, the biggest thing was just the attention to detail as far as, like, you know, scouting. You know, you're being scouted, you know, and, and you're doing the scouting. So just, the, just the, the adjustment to, like, how you're playing against certain people – you have to remember what you're doing every single play, no matter who's in, you got to know how to guard them. And then you also adjust it to people, how people are guarding you. You know, now it's not as easy to go, you know, through the legs and go with your left. Now you got to find other ways to get back to what you're good at and stick into your strengths. And um, throughout all that, you know, it, it was a learning process. We had up and downs. We had really good highs and we had really low lows, like you said, because we were, we were the youngest team in the country, I think. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it was a great year. It was a great experience. And um, that, that also made me a better player. Now, we come up to January 28th. And overall, if you look at the season averages, it might not be as crazy as it might have been. But once you start starting, it's really where you start seeing how great you can be. And that first start came January 28th. Take us to that night, though. Coach talks to you, says you're starting now. You're a starting point guard going forward. What was your reaction? How did you kind of take us to how that all went down? First game I started was SEC play when we played at Auburn. Um, Coach Crean actually didn't tell me. It was Coach Dollar who told me. He was like, yo, you know you're starting tomorrow. I was like, for real? He was like, yeah. He was like, you know, like, let's go. And then, you know, I found out from Coach Cream literally right before the game when they were talking about who's guarding who. <laughs> he mentioned my name. So I had to act like I was surprised, but I already knew. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's just a testament to all the work I put in throughout that year. And I'm um, constantly producing. I'm being that, you know, accepting and, and, and being the best at my role was before that was coming off the bench, providing that spark. Um, of, of, you know, that spark of energy, that spark of leadership. I'm on a defensive end, being a pest and offensively, you know, creating, getting the paint and, and making plays for others. And, you know, when, when you do that all the time and, and coach is going to, they're going to notice it. And um, when I, when it was noticed, you know, I got put into the starting lineup and, and things went, went good from there. A couple of different games I want to touch up on throughout your career last year. 
You had a game winner against SMU last year, and that really was something that really blew you up. A lot of people started getting some more national recognition on you. Just take us to that night, because that obviously was a big game for you. What was – just take us to that play, how it all went down. Yeah, I mean, it was a big night. Um, it was a big game. Um, you know, playing against a good SMU team. Um, they're, they're a team from Texas, so that's mm-hmm. always a little bit more exciting when you're playing guys from back home. Um, it was the first game of the year for our guy, Jordan Harris. Um, we, you know, we wanted to make sure he was off to a good start. So, um, you know, it was a back-and-forth game. Um, teams were making play after play. Ant had a good game. Rashawn had a good game. Um, Tyree Crump made some big shots. And, um, you know, we had we had home court advantage, so the stag was rocking. You could literally hear the noise vibrating under your feet. And um, at the end of the game, uh, it, it was just time to make a play. You know, overtime, I think I had to lay up to send it to overtime, mm-hmm. um, tie it up. But the last play, I mean, Coach had just put – they knew he was going to deny Anthony, so we kind of used Ant as a decoy mm-hmm. to have him run around and kind of get to the corner because we knew they was going to face guard him, so it was going to be no help. And then Coach just sent two – Two ball screens high and a horse type action. I came off, and then it was it. I, I saw the paint, and it was like, man, I'm going left. It's not many people are stopping me from going left if I get the lane. And uh, I, I end up making the play. When would you say Coach Korean really started trusting you? Because to put the ball in a freshman hands when you have a lot of veterans on that team, a couple of different guys, obviously you have Ant, all these guys, like just having them, obviously you set up to go kick the game when he shot. Like when would you say started trusting you? Yeah, I think, I think Coach trusted me the whole year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say that because, you know, as a freshman, you would think, uh, you know, you come in the game off the bench, you make a couple, you know, have make, you don't make the plays that you usually make, you turn it over, you're constantly looking at the bench like, man, am I going to get subbed out? Am I going to get subbed out? <laughs> and I never had that with, with Coach Cream. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he never felt me like I was playing. He never treated me or made me feel like I was playing under pressure. Um, he always gave me that leash um, to, you know, to play through mistakes. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he told me that when he recruited me. He's like, you know, you, I'm going to allow you to play through mistakes, so don't. Don't hang your head on the, next, on, on the possession that just happened. Move on to the next one. Make the next play. Don't worry about it. have short-term memory. Next play, next play. And, and that gives you freedom, and that gives you confidence as a player, especially as a freshman um, point guard. So knowing that I could make mistakes, like I'm not trying to do it on purpose, but knowing I could and I could still be okay and I could still play my game and I could still affect the game on the next possession is, is just a great confidence and a great um, sense of trust that you have from your head coach. That's, that is a great feeling. Now, if you go back to when you first got on campus, did you expect yourself to come out and ultimately end up breaking the freshman record for assists that year, become a starter midway through the year? Like, did you see yourself becoming this good that early on? Yeah, I did. Um, I never go, in, go into a situation thinking that I won't, you know, succeed or won't do what I mm-hmm. think I can do. Um, you know, that's that's not how I was raised. That's not what my confidence <laughs> um, is. Is that my confidence level is that I always think I can be the best and, and do and do those kind of things. I know I'm a gifted pastor. I'm a guy who can score the ball, but um, I know I could get my teammates involved. And um, I knew if I got the opportunity um, to show that I can make everyone better and help us win games, I knew all that stuff would take care of itself because we had guys who could make shots. We had guys who could finish. So I knew all that stuff was in the works, was in the cards for us, for me. Out of all the crazy stuff Ant did throughout the course of last year and a lot of different highlight plays you guys had, you ultimately finished up with the number one highlight play last year on Sports Center, the half-court buzzer beater. Take us to that game. What went through your mind? Take us to that game against Ole Miss. Oh, the buzzer beat, that was crazy. <laughs> um, when I got the rebound, I saw it was either Ant or Jordan on my left. Mm-hmm. And I'm dribbling. I know I could get a layup, but I saw them ahead of me. So I kind of hesitated for a second. And as I hesitated, it was like, sah, sah, sah. So I'm running and looking. And I end up in a shooting motion at the same time. <laughs> I just kind of slowed down and let it go at this, as the buzzer went off. And when I went in, that was crazy. Because I was not expecting it for it to go in. It felt good, though. I either knew it was going to be good or, or short. But um, that, that was cool. That, that was super cool. You know, my teammates came. You know, they celebrated with me. And it was a big win, not only because it was SEC, but we had lost to Ole Miss um, in the regular season. And for us to get that win back was big time. I want to go into a little bit more about Ant we have in this past year. And we know he's got a lot of his stuff. He's a funny personality. We're continuing to see throughout his rookie year so far. We also know he's a rapper, too. What's just like in that locker room? You get to hang out with him more than anyone else does last year. You're around him all the time. What's yeah. Ant like off the court? Exactly what you see. Exactly what you're seeing right now. Exactly what every, the world is experiencing is what he like is on an everyday basis. But imagine when he's super comfortable with you. Like he's always joking. He's always laughing. He's always dancing. Always trying to put you on the newest thing. The song could be four years old and he thinks he puts you <laughs> on the song. So uh, that, that, that's Ant. You know, he's a guy, you know, who always loves to have fun. 
What's the funniest memory you remember with him from last year? There are way too many memories that, <laughs> to count. Uh, you know, we did a whole bunch of crazy stuff. Some of the stuff, you know, necessary. You might get in trouble for anywhere else. But uh, <laughs> uh, man, and the rest of the team, that, that was by far the funniest and most fun I've had um, on, a, on a basketball team ever. Like, those guys made me cry from tears, just like tears of laughter more, like every single day, every single day. And there were more freshmen than anyone else in that locker room last year, but did you guys ever get freshman prank where the seniors ever do anything to make you guys do nah. prank or chores? No, 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 no. Because the seniors were as childish and, and funny as us. <laughs> I don't think they could have pulled off a prank if they wanted to. They'll probably, you know, end up laughing about it before they mm -hmm. could do it. And now there's another guy in this year, though. Another freshman came in, obviously, for whatever reason, NCAA wanted to sit him out for half the season. Obviously, he got cleared. That was ridiculous for that situation. But obviously, Ant Sam, but Katie Johnson's up next. I'm, I'm super high on him, too. And you're going to get another year together next year. But kind of discuss Katie. What's special about him and how excited you will continue to grow with him? Yeah, Katie, you know, he meant a lot to us. Um, just his impact on the game. You can see as soon as he steps on the court, just that, that passion he plays, but he plays with great emotion he plays with great aggressiveness and um he's constantly trying to keep attacking keep attacking whether it's you know offense you know getting downhill getting to the paint getting to the free throw line creating contact and he makes shots and defensively you know he's a pest he harasses the ball he's in the passing lanes you know you know he's stripping down on the bigs so you know his impact was imminent and it, it was immediate and um you know he's been a big thing he's been a big guy for us and he's going to be even bigger a bigger weapon for us in the upcoming years you guys see him firsthand. This is something that I don't think a lot of people talk about. First of all, I think he's one of the more underrated freshmen in the country last year, obviously because he didn't play as many games. But he came in in the middle of a pandemic as a freshman, not being able to even play with you guys for that long. And he comes in and makes an impact. I think scored 10 plus just about every single game. How like, how special is he? Because seeing the ways he able to come in with all the adversity he dealt with, like how special truly could he be? Yeah, um, we knew he could make that, that kind of impact immediately just by – you know, in practice, you know, just because he didn't play doesn't mean he didn't practice. He practiced with us every day. And um, when he was scrimmage, he did the same thing. So we knew what kind of, we knew what he was capable of. We were just like, man, it's only a matter of time before you, before you get freed. And when it stay free, you man, it, it's up. Like it's time, it's time to go. And um, that's exactly what happened. And um, he was always positive throughout everything, no matter, you know, if they, they said they was going to, you know, let him play the, the second game of the year originally. He was supposed to play the second game, didn't do it. You know, now it's the fifth game of the year. They didn't do it. Now it's against Cincinnati. They, you know, didn't do it. Now, oh, first game of SEC, didn't do it. But throughout it all, you know, he kept his head up. He stayed positive. He stayed working. And he made sure whenever the time was, he was ready. And, um, you know, that's a testament to him and his toughness, his mental toughness, and um, his love for the games. Just no matter what's going to happen, you know, I'm going to stay positive. I'm going to be with my teammates. And I'm going to make sure I'm ready for the moment. The difference between him and Ann is obviously we knew Ann was going to be one done. It was going to be one year with you, too. Now, Katie, obviously, he gets half of the year, and now he's also probably his entire year next year with you guys. How can that kind of work out now? You were talking about you two. I think one more special duos in this SEC next year. How special can you two be together? Yeah, we, we complement each other really well. We're both, you know, speedy, strong guards um, that really attack you on both ends of the court. And um, that, that's hard to deal with, especially with when speed kills in the SEC. You know, it's such a fast league. But if you have two of the fastest, there's not much people going to be able to do with it. And he's so productive. Um so next year when he gets, you know, those meaningful, you know, 30-plus minutes a night, people are going to really feel him. And um, he's a great player, and I know he's going to continue to get better because um, I know he has goals that he wants to achieve as well. Where will this dynamic do between you two rank up amongst the other SEC players? Um, I know Chess as a, as a combo, next year we're going to be, you know, one of the best, the best, you know, backcourts in the SEC for sure. You had eight double-doubles this year. I said your numbers were already incredible. But what allowed you to kind of take us to this next level? Because you're able to balance scoring and assisting. How do you learn to do that? Um, that's something I've done my, my whole life. Mm. I've always been like that. I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a score first nor a pass first. I'm guard. I'm just, I'm just a make the right, right play guy. I'm a dynamic playmaker. And meaning if the play is for me to feed the hot hand five times in a row, mm. that's what I'm going to do with no, no debate. But if the play is for me to score the ball three times in a row, finish the game by shooting the ball, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just a guy who's trying to make winning plays. And I'm the guy that can do both. I'm a guy who can score when the team is. I'm a guy who could make others better, make, you know, the game easier for everybody else. And um, I think that's that's how I was, you know, raised as a basketball player, always to make the right play first. And um, that's why, you know, you can kind of see those double-double numbers um, so frequently.
look back at your first two years that are now in the books. What are some of your favorite memories and what do you say is the is your favorite game so far? Um, my favorite memories, um, you know, we beat we beat some good teams. I think one of the best uh, wins we've had was at Memphis at the time. I think they were number eight in the country. Mm -hmm. um, we went down there last year and we beat them. That was a great win. Um, Auburn at home when they were ranked 13th last year. Um, you know, we beat Mizzou. But uh, I think one of my best games and one of my personal favorite games was this past year against LSU when I recorded the first triple-double in uh, UGA history. And it was a great win, great team win. We beat a really good LSU team. And, uh, we, you know, we came to play that night, and, I, and that was just a lot of fun. Absolutely. Well, a few more things before I let you go, one of which is discussing a big game you were part of before, big ball around All-American game. You went off in that game. We're going against a guy that in Mello that also is a big-time rookie this year. And you put up 34 points, eight assists, co-MVP of that game. Take us to that game. Uh, that was crazy. <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was super last minute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they came on with it. It was like, hey, you know, we want to invite you. And meeting, you know, the VAR ball was on and popping in front of every TV at the time. Um, and so meeting him was cool. You know, he, he's just, he acts just like he does on TV. But, you know, when you talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, it's way more, you know, toned down. But, you know, he still has that same charismatic personality. Um, he's still funny. And, um, you know, that was a great event put on by them. I was super thankful for them for that opportunity because I feel like that that played a part in, you know, my exposure as well and getting out there nationally. Um, so, I mean, that, that was good. It was great players. You know, CB was there, Christian Brown. Uh, I think he, he, you know, he started his recruiting pitch to Georgia when I was there. Um, so uh, that, that, was a, that was a fun experience, obviously, you know, playing against and playing with LaMelo in practice and all that. Um, that, that was super cool. A couple of college questions I want to touch up on. We know it's been crazy the past while now. We see the transfer portal is really going off right now. And we just see all this stuff because there's no more transferring availability. Obviously, I believe you're still locked in at Georgia now going forward. But what's your thoughts on that? Having guys go just leave with one year and just go right away? Like, what's your thoughts on the whole transfer portal and how it's looking right now? Um, yeah, I'm not really, you know, super familiar as far as, like, you know, all the process with it. But mm -hmm. I know, um, you know, it's either two things. Guys went to a situation where they didn't feel comfortable you know, uh, you know, it just didn't work out or guys actually did try and they still didn't feel comfortable. But um, those are the main two. But you know, people transfer for schools for all different reasons. It's not necessarily just because basketball, maybe something happened, you know, they need to get closer back to home or maybe they didn't feel comfortable outside of basketball. Because at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's, the basketball is going to stop. You still got to worry about um, life. And you want to feel comfortable when you're not, when you're away from the court. So um, I know everyone's just trying to do what, what's best for themselves. And um, you, can't, you can't knock that. You got to respect it, um, even when it seems like, man, he shouldn't have done that. But you don't, you don't know what his life is like. You don't know what's going outside of, you know, when he's with you bouncing the ball. So, um, I, you know, I try to understand everyone's situation and know, like, you know, at the end, they, they are trying to do what's best for themselves or what they believe is. And you can't, you can't knock someone for doing that. The other two big things, one is the name, image, and likeness. We know it's coming into effect next year. Yeah. How excited are you for that? And how do you kind of plan to utilize that? Yeah, I'm super excited. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when money's involved, you got to be excited, <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, I'm super excited with that. Um, you know, I plan, I plan to use that to my advantage. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, to gain profit, but also just to, just to clean up and, and continue to build my brand. Um, you know, that's also another way where I can kind of use my voice, um, not only for, you know, just basic stuff, like as far as sponsor advertising, but, you know, to kind of use my voice to talk about what I want to talk about. I have uh, an audience already built in into it. So I think that's going to help a lot. Um, also, just to have a, my jersey, hopefully, so I can give it to my family members, you know. With your you name know. on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. My last name, my number. Um, just, just for them, just for them to be able to have to be like, man, I got his jersey. I remember when he, when he played for the University of Georgia. Um, you know, I still got that jersey hanging in my bedroom right now. Mm -hmm. So just stuff like that I want to be able to do. And I want my family and all that to be able to share that same experience, you know, when I'm done. Another one is that obviously if, if you have an NBA opportunity, that's something you're going to take when the time comes. But if it's an opportunity where you come and possibly use your fifth year because this year didn't count towards eligibility, we're looking at you already kind of skyrocketing up these rankings and records all the time at Georgia. And by the time you're a senior, you could be up there. But what about the fifth year? Is that something you might consider? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously the fifth year is a, is a, you know, is a great option. It's a un unique option. Um, if that's what it takes, and that's what it takes. But my goal has never been, you know, to, oh, yeah, I'm going to do five-year college. I'm trying to, yeah. you, know, give, you know, obviously do as well as I can do, do in school 
and and obviously it's to play professional basketball, it's to get to the NBA. And um, I, that that's my main focus. I've never really thought about the fifth year, but if it takes that, that's what it is. But um, my my goal is to get to the NBA, you know, as soon as possible. I'm um, winning the college level, dominate the college level, do what I need to do, and then move on to the next level. A couple of things in your social media pages, one of which is El General. Take us to that. Uh, that's my Snapchat. I made that when I was like four, fourth grade, <laughs> third, fourth grade. I was trying to be funny because I thought, you know, L is he in, yeah. in this place. And I thought general was that in Spanish as well. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you can't change your Snapchat name. So I kind of just roll with it. And, you know, mm -hmm. when I go back home, people always call me by my Snapchat name. <laughs> <laughs> And another thing you have is you're going to feel me one way or another. Discuss that and what that means to you. Yeah, that that was one. Um, you know, that, that was I think that's pinned on my Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just you know, like you can count me out, you can do whatever you want, but you gotta respect me. You mm -hmm. know, you're gonna make you're gonna know I'm there. And that was something I put out maybe my, my junior or sophomore year when I felt like I was putting in the work, I was you know winning my matchups, getting at people, but people were still was like ah little iffy so mm -hmm. I just put that out there just every time I go on my social media to remind myself like yo like you're not coming here you know to mess around you're coming here to dominate to prove um you're as good as you know as you know you are and to prove those other dudes who don't think you're that good that man at, at some point I gotta respect him like he's done too much for me to keep hating on him and so mm -hmm. that's always just a bit of of it made of a bit a bit of motivation because especially because everyone goes on Twitter every single day <laughs> so every time I log into my Twitter it's the first thing I see so just to keep me you know, internally motivated without, you know, having to say it all the time. Absolutely, man. Well, the thing I was, like, wrapping up discussing is your legacy. I know that all guys want to build that legacy for themselves. So when you are done playing basketball someday, when that day does come, what do you ultimately want to remember for what you achieve both on and off the court? Yeah, on the court, obviously, I want to, you know, get get to the NBA level and, and, and you know, be a guy, uh, being known as a guy who won games. I made a ton of money from the game of basketball who played basketball the right way, but also use my platform to, you know, to help others. Obviously, with everything going down, the social injustice, um, to be able to prove, not to prove, but, you know, bring more of an awareness of what's going on. Um, you know, obviously bring programs and such to the people who are less fortunate, um, to those in the, in, the, in the areas where they live that they don't have the same access as, per se, someone who goes to a private school. Because um, mm. I've, been, I've been to both. I've been to the private school where, you know, they have the best facilities, you know, second to none education in the city. I also went, you know, to middle school to the school in, in you know, what you call the hood in Fifth Ward, Texas, um, mm -hmm. where where you don't have that, you know, where the facilities aren't aren't great, um, where the teachers, you know, they kind of come and go. You know, you got a new principal every month. Mm -hmm. So I just want to help the people in in, that, in, that, in those communities to know that, man, you can go here and there's still a way for you to get out. There's still ways for you. Um, so say college isn't your thing, but I can give you some skills, whether, you know, it'd be carpeting, I mean, being really good at mathematics and technology, provide those, those type of programs to those, to those schools who, who don't have it. So I, I kind of want to help the community and also be known as, you know, a pretty good basketball player too, along the way. Absolutely, man. Well, final thing for you, give Georgia fans your three biggest goals you have set for the remainder of your Georgia career. Yeah, obviously top five, finish in the SEC, mm -hmm. make it to the tournament, make it to the Sweet 16. And, you know, to break every single record, <laughs> every assist record, every steal record, you know, might sprinkle and break a point record at some point, too, as well. Absolutely, man. Well, I'm definitely excited to see what guy got next for you. Appreciate you taking time to come on today, and best of luck, man. Appreciate you. Of course, you're welcome, my man. God bless. All right, bro.